Good evening, friends, and thank you for being here on a Monday evening in the midst of a working week or the beginning of a working week and all the traffic in this city. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be in conversation with my dear friend Mukund. Uh, Mukund did a conversation on my book two years ago at the Chennai International Center, and uh, I only hope that I do justice to his work and uh, I mean, people are still talking about the way he had created the questions and uh, spoke, you know, uh, conducted that particular event, and I hope I can do justice to it. Uh, the, the story, as Vikram introduced us to it, The Great Flap of uh, 1942, is a fascinating work because it takes us through this journey of uh, how, what happened during the Second World War and an episode that eventually never really comes to take place. Uh, I'll begin with uh, a reading, the first page of uh, the book, the introduction, and then we'll uh, go on to the question-answer session proper. In the early hours of 7th April 1942, three Japanese aircraft were spotted over the Bay of Bengal by an aging Atalanta on a routine reconnaissance mission from Madras. The hulking plane was fondly referred to as the Victory Bus, because it was used for patrols every day, or the lazy Susan because it chuntered along at a genial pace. Essentially a passenger aircraft that served the British Empire's colonies in Africa, it could carry up to nine passengers. Some Atlantas found their way into the British Overseas Airways Corporation in India. From there, they made their way into the Royal Air Force, each fitted with a single .303 machine gun. So long in the tooth, the Atlanta could have been easily extracted out of the sky by the three Japanese aircraft, whatever their make or type. But oddly enough, it was the Japanese pilots who veered away after studying the aircraft intently, apparently frightened by the four-engine plane's size. The story that made the rounds in Madras was that the Japanese turned and fled in terror, suspecting that it was some sort of new secret British weapon. If true, this was possibly the only instance until then of the British scaring off the Japanese in World War II. It was invariably the other way around, with British India cowering in fear over an impending Japanese attack, a dread that had set in when Japan entered the war a few months earlier. So that's how the book really begins. And uh, so Mukund, would you like to comment on why the book? Um, yes, <laughs> why the book? Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Vikram and the BIC. Uh, I've just heard so much about this institution, uh, despite you know living in Chennai, um, and I'm just delighted, uh, you know, not only to be here but also to talk about the book at uh, at at an institution like this. Also, thank you, Sriram. I mean, um, you know. I know I did your book, but I've sort of read you and, and you know, I read the musings, so you're very much a part of uh, my reading life in a way. So uh, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Uh, why the book? Um, well, let me twist the question. Maybe uh, how did this book come about? This book came about largely because um, I grew up with the story. Um, you know, my mother was one of those who, who fled, like almost everyone in Madras. Um, as you know in the book, I suggest, and this is uh, something that surprises uh, even people who know about the exodus in Madras, that uh, conservatively 75% of the population fled, possibly up to 90% fled at that time. And as I grew up, it was not just my mother, it was everyone I knew who had a father or a grandfather had left. And so somewhere at the back of my mind, I knew that there was a story waiting to be written. Uh, while I was a journalist, there was no time to write it, but I do remember many, many years ago having a free afternoon, spending it in the uh, British Library, uh, looking for documents, actually communication between uh, Governor Hope and uh, you know Condon Smith, which were part of the fortnightly reports, and bringing them back, but then not doing much with it. Um, so it was only after 2019 that I sort of got around to, to doing the book. And, um, and then what began as a story 
essentially, I think I thought it would mainly be about Madras. I discovered was, uh, you know, Madras was just a small part of it. That the panic uh, and the great flap was uh, pretty much pan-national. Uh, people fled interior places. Uh, people fled, uh, you know, unlikely places such as Ahmedabad, Delhi. Um, uh, people fled Calcutta and, and, and Bombay in large numbers, of course. Uh, but people also, f there were strange incidents in towns like Uti and Kodakanal. So the flap is, one part of the story of the flap is just a story of, of uh, a largely unmapped exodus of people. Uh, so that's one, one part of the story that, that kind of interested me. And as I worked on it, I discovered that it needed to be broader, that the narrative arc had to be greater. So um, I tried to map what was happening in India with the Japanese advances in, in Southeast Asia. And of course, I tried to make the case that the events of 1942, the momentous events of 1942, essentially, which were essentially the Crips mission and uh, Gandhi's call for Quit India, uh, which reams and reams have been written about, uh, need to be uh, at least analyzed and explained in the context of what was happening. Because this, the, all this was happening when Japan was on the rampage in Southeast Asia. And I tried to suggest that the impact it had on the nationalist movement is something that perhaps hasn't been given the due it has. So essentially, that's a long-winded long -winded way of answering the question. But, but uh, I would entirely agree with you with the fact that this becomes more a pan-Indian work or even a pan-empire work, if I can call it that, because it, Madras is, as you say very rightly, is just one city in this uh, whole narrative. And uh, it also uh, surprises me because the way we Chennai people or Madras people have always taken pride in the fact that in the First World War, we were the only city to be bombed. In the Second World War, we were the only ones not to be bombed. And we keep talking about it all the time well, as though the rest of the country didn't exist. <laughs> there was nothing else happening anywhere. Else. There was one reconnaissance plane <laughs> that fun. came uh, in October 1943 and dropped a few bombs in the harbor. Uh, but, you know, the flap was over by then. Uh, and apparently that was a day of power failure, so nobody yeah. knew about it. And the newspapers didn't even report it the well, next day. Well, single column in the Hindu. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just for record, yeah. yeah. Which uh, takes me to the next question, which is one uh, consistent uh, takeaway from this book particularly, and I hope that others also will make a point to note that, is the racism that comes through uh, right across. Because today, you know, 75 years after independence, I think we've, there are lots of people who look back on it with a kind of a rosy hue. They keep uh, looking, oh, and the Kalatla, oh, the British, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly you find that when it came to evacuation, when it came to protection, it's always their people who mattered first, while everybody else was kind of thrown into the front line. Uh, it keeps coming back in various pages in this book. Yeah, I think, I think it comes across in two ways. One is that um, the, I mean, the, the Indian army or Indians in the army were formed the majority uh, in World War II. Uh, they were larger in number than the British or the Australians or, or the Chinese for that matter. And uh, when the Indians went there, there was uh, a kind of racism that existed in places like Malaysia. Uh, that they themselves were shocked by. And there is a theory that, uh, that the, the formation of the INA, which uh, you know, uh, happened um, pretty early, um, as soon as the Japanese took some control of northern Malaya, uh, uh, was helped along by the fact that uh, Indian soldiers worked under pretty racist kind of conditions. Um, so. I mean, there, there, how much it, it was a contributory factor is, uh, is, is a question you can debate. There's a, there's a historian called Hugh Toy who mentioned, who says it's probably exaggerated. But there's no doubt that, uh, that the way British people treated Indian officers, and, and there are examples of this uh, in the book, um, just maybe uh, just nudge them a little. Uh, in more into the Japanese hands. And uh, the Japanese had, you know, a very, very good strike rate. The very few people um, held out. 
I mean, some people held out for a while and then they joined. Uh, some held out altogether, but most people just went along. I mean, and this was remarkable that uh, the people who surrendered to the Japanese in Malaya and Singapore uh, were all willing to sign up uh, uh, for the Japanese effort uh, under Mohan Singh, it was then, um, to sort of rid India of the British. So that, I think, uh, racism does play a role. And as far as evacuation, yes, I mean, there is the evacuation of Penang, where uh, the, the European population just slip away. And so does the, uh, the, the, the white army men under the cover of night, uh, leaving the population uh, at the mercy of the Japanese. And, I, and there's a mention of this, uh, uh, the great historian Chris Bailey of Cambridge actually calls it uh, the most shameful uh, moment in, of the British Empire. So, and yeah. what is even more scary is the fact that the enemy didn't know that the whites had left. So they kept bombarding the town and killing the civilian population, which had no means of communicating to them that the army had already gone away. Yes. And finally, it's a journalist who takes control. Well, an editor called, a uh, Tamil huh. editor called Manika Soti Sarvanamuthu, who uh, may be a Sri Lankan origin. And uh, yeah, so he has this idea that uh, let's get the Union Jack down and, and put an Indian flag up. Uh, but that doesn't stop the bombing because I don't think the Japanese noticed that. Uh, but it, it's a few days after they realize that, uh, you know, the British, the army has left, uh, the Europeans have all left. So they just walk into Penang and, and take it over and then subject the population to further. Yeah, <laughs> quite a bit of trouble. The. Uh, other aspect that really comes across when we read The Great Flap is how few of the Europeans were actually there and how they were able to control an entire empire. Uh, you keep referring to, you know, just a handful of uh, Englishmen in every location. And we seem to have been very happy and content with somebody administering us with just such few numbers yeah. right through uh, during that time. That's true. I mean, this is a point that's made before that, uh, you know, that uh, the men who ruled us were not uh, very large in numbers. And um, I think that's true of the flap itself. I mean, these were uh, people who had, by 42, uh, access to great resources. Uh, so they hired a lot of Indians, uh, but uh, there were not that many Europeans uh, uh, at that time. But that story was a phenomenal one. I hope I'm not giving away much of the book, but uh, the racism was to such an extent that uh, when an Indian officer would get into the swimming pool, the whites would all leave immediately. So finally, one of them solves the problem by getting all the Indians to come and stand around the pool, the Indian officers. And there is this English woman. Every time she enters the water, they enter in along with her. She immediately comes out. They all come out along with her. Then when she gets in again, they all jump in again till the lesson is reached that, you know, <laughs> We can keep doing this forever. So that's a great story in this uh, particular book about their behavior. The, uh, did the English really, I mean, we speak about the uh, level of chaos and the fact that they, were, they didn't anticipate. But did they really underestimate the Japanese to that extent? And uh, that underestimation seems to have continued even now when you look at accounts of the Second World War as written. There's very little that is really mentioned about the Japanese, apart from Pearl Harbor and uh, the fact that they invaded Malaysia and Singapore. The focus seems to be forever on Hitler and Mussolini, <clears throat> and not so much to an extent on what the Japanese did. I think they're worried about the Japanese. I'm not sure uh, if they underestimated Japanese military strength in a general way. What they got terribly wrong Particular, particularly the, uh, uh, the people in India and, and in England, uh, they believed that once the Japanese had launched uh, the attack on Malaya, which they launched synchronously with Pearl Harbor, as you know, Pearl Harbor, the, the, Pearl Harbor the, the, the objective of Pearl Harbor was very limited. Take out the American fleet so that we have the run of Southeast Asia and its resources, tin, rubber, oil, so on. Um, so. I mean, I make this point that, you know, lots of films have been done about Pearl Harbor, but the, the Japanese were really interested in Southeast Asia. Um, they were only interested in neutralizing the Americans uh, so that they could do what they wanted over there. Um, so what the British got wrong is when they attacked the North of Malaya, they thought 
that for many reasons, geography being one of them, uh, because you know there's a thick spine of, of sort of forest that runs to Malaya, that there's no way the Japanese could get south. And so even as they came down, uh, you know, Hope, others, Lin Lithgow, others were telling Indians that, look, as long as Singapore is safe, we are safe. I mean, Singapore was, you know, the unimpregnable fortress. Um, and as, as long as Singapore is safe, we're safe. I mean, you know. And uh, the Japanese uh, just came through with such speed. And then Singapore fell by February 15th, uh, 1942. That they didn't anticipate. Um, they didn't anticipate at all, um, because uh, partly because, as, as lots of people know, that most of Singapore gu guns were facing south towards the sea. Uh, no one expected uh, an attack on Singapore from the north. And uh, British policy had always been to look at the northwest. They always thought Russia was the big danger. And now you suddenly had a new force coming in from the southeast. Did it take time yeah, for them to... Yeah, they, they, I mean, essentially, if you look at British uh, writing at that time, the threats to India were, were from the northwest and maybe from the northeast uh, because the, the Japanese were in China already. Uh, no one had anticipated a threat emerging from um, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, Linda Thur's biographer, his son, claims that he did. Uh, but the truth is that... Uh, I think it was uh, filial I, love yeah, I more think, than anything Yeah, I else. think that <laughs> probably was an exaggeration. I mean, his son, um, you know, has this passage where Lindithgo, uh, Viceroy Lindithgo, by the way, is lying in his library, poring over maps and worrying about uh, Japanese attack on Singapore. Uh, but essentially, they were surprised that it came from this quarter. You mentioned Lindithgo, so I think we may as well move on to the next question. There are two people who keep coming back in this story. One is Lord Linlithgow, who is the Viceroy, and the other is Sir Arthur Hope, who is the governor of Madras. Uh, later in history, neither of them is judged in any favorable light, and perhaps rightfully so. But in this work, they come across as fairly contrasting characters. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh. Well, as you know, Nehru famously described Linlitko as uh, a rock with a, a rock's lack of awareness or something like that. And, uh, He's uh, supposed to have been only interested in insemination of yeah, cows. Yeah, he was a cold... Uh, yeah. Bull and, and cow were the two yeah, things. Unfeeling kind of uh, Maybe he'll man. find an echo today. And um, <laughs> <laughs> hope... Uh, and we knew... we. We became aware of this only about 20 years ago. Um, Hope was recalled in, uh, in, uh, you know, um, in the mid-40s as governor of Madras because he just borrowed money uh, from all kinds of people uh, for his betting. He used to like betting on horses. He borrowed money from Indians as well and also from Madura courts and, and the, the head of Madura courts and so on. And this scandal was hushed up at the level of the king the Prime Minister, everyone else, Secretary of State. And um, he was asked to go back. And the Times then uh, the, of London um, sort of looked through the archives and found this and did these stories about a uh, uh, couple of decades back, uh, which is probably why Hope never left papers. And you know, I wish he had, because this book would have been much richer if he had left papers. Um, so there was that. There was this corrupt. Uh, man, or at least a man with great weaknesses who is prone to borrowing money. That's one side of him. But there's another side, which I discovered on reading the communication between him and, 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 and Lindutko. Uh, and I've read Lindutko's communications with various uh, heads of various provinces, Orissa, Bengal, Bombay, and so on. And the funny thing about Hope is that he is perhaps the boldest in the way he writes to Lindutko. Um, he tells Lindutko, look, be honest about what's happening. Um, because, you know, when Rangoon is bombed, there's so much panic here. Uh, they lie about the casualty figures. They're also giving the casualty figures two weeks afterwards. And this was a, a typical war stratagem. So Indians learned that the Andamans fell on March 23rd, only in April, uh, early April. So, uh, and he's telling Hope that, look, uh, tell the truth. 
because you people, hope is yeah, the hope is telling Lithgow. Because if you don't tell the truth, rumors abound and then panic abounds. So essentially, exactly what pans out in this book, because what happens is there's panic, that breeds rumors, that beats flight, flight beats further rumors, that meets panic. So there's this endless cycle of that, you know, that, that keeps going on, which has exactly happened, uh, which is what exactly happened in 42. And Hope is one of the few people who, who, who sort of tells Lindutko, tell the truth. Um, and uh, Lindutko disagrees with him. He thinks uh, British, British policy is, is of, of, well, being economical with the truth is better. <laughs> yeah. In fact, there is a passage, I think, that merits reading on that. Uh, I think we, we said we wouldn't uh, read that one. But uh, the, uh, you know, this portion about how quickly the Japanese were able to come in and take charge of the entire uh, region, would you like to read that or would you want me to? I've never read before, but I'll try. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if I have a great reading voice, but which one? This is first and then going right down to how the ships were helpless in. Yeah, so I, I think a bit of context. So what, what happens is, even though the Japanese have no plan of invading India, uh, they send out uh, Nagumo, who is the hero of Pearl Harbor, into the Indian Ocean. He comes in with uh, six aircraft carriers, a string of uh, cruisers and destroyers, and uh, bombs Colombo and bombs Trincomalee, uh, takes out the Hermes, which is one of, um, you know, an aging aircraft carrier. And what, what he's looking for is to destroy um, uh, the British Eastern Fleet. The British Eastern Fleet is in Singapore. Uh, Singapore f falls on February 15th. And so they move uh, their, the Eastern Fleet to Trincomalee in Ceylon. Um, what Nagumo doesn't know uh, is that, by some luck, uh, sort of some of Somerville's ship, Admiral Somerville, who's the head of the Eastern Fleet, is, is actually uh, in the Maldives in a place called Adu Atoll where they have a secret base. At the same time, there's a, there's a B fleet headed by another Vice Admiral called Ozawa, which comes into the Bay of Bengal. So this is this area off the coast of what is Orissa now, broadly. And he has one light aircraft carrier and, and many other ships. They split into three, uh, into three, uh, uh, you know, a southern group, a central group, and a northern group. And their brief is to just take down merchant ships, any shipping in the Bay of Bengal. And this story actually hardly gets play even in the Indian press. So I, there are a lot of people I met who know that, for instance, Vishakhapatnam and Kokana, Kakinada or Kokanada were bombed, uh, but don't know that Ozawa was running rampage and that people were washed up on the Orissa coast, so uh, the flap does deal with this. So this passage is really about uh, Fleet B, which is Ozawa's fleet, uh, which sails into the Bay of Bengal, and, and, and so I'll just read a bit of that. So on 1st April, this is 1942, Vice Admiral Jisabura Ozawa led his fleet out from Mergue in southern Burma, westwards into the Bay of Bengal. His Malay Flores fleet was smaller than Nagomo's, built around the light carrier Ruijo, six cruisers and four destroyers. Ozawa lingered near the channel that separates the Andaman and Nicobar Islands for a couple of days, probably waiting to synchronize his attack with Nagomo's. Nagomo is in doing his dirty in uh, Ceylon. On the morning of April 4th, 4th he, head, he headed in the general direction of Orissa on India's northeastern coast. By then, the Andamans were already in Japanese control. It was a foregone conclusion that the Bay Islands could not be defended. And then there's a little bit on, on what happens in the Andamans, which I'll skip. At the crack of dawn on 5th April, bombers lifted off the Ruyuru on a search and destroy mission, sinking one ship, disabling another, and damaging a third. Before sunset that evening, Osawa divided his naval force into three groups, which headed towards different points of the Ind Indian coastline. Ozawa himself was part of the central group, which made up the Ryujo and five other ships. The three groups were fairly spread out, 
the distance between the southern and northern ones as much as 400 miles. It was easy pickings. The following day, the northern group sank seven ships in a little over three hours, starting with the Norwegian tanker Elsa, which was on its way to, from Madras to Calcutta with a belly full of kerosene. Not long afterwards, a Japanese biplane located six merchant ships sailing close to the coastline. There was an attempt to scatter, but the Japanese warships caught up with the group and sank all ships, and the names of these ships, the Molda, the Autoclist, the Indra, so on and so forth, were speedily sunk. Together, the three groups sank at least 20 ships and damaged uh, three more in the space of two days. It was an attack of international dimensions. 11 flew US, UK flags. Three, of, three each of the remaining nine were Nether of Netherlands, Norway, and the United States. The merchant ships were completely helpless against the might of Ozawa's force. And, uh, you know, there's one man called Stanley Salt who actually survives this. And he describes... Uh, how they would sink the ships and 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 uh, uh, and thus watch these guys clamber onto boats and not shoot at them, but sort of leer over their destroyers, grinning at at them as a, as they were struggling, and so at least 500 people uh, from the ship wash up uh, onto the store, and uh, so that's one of the stories of the flap, and uh, again, I mean, you know, I just want to digress here a bit. Um, so that's the military side. Uh, but there are things that happen during that period. Uh, you know, I make the point that the exodus was not about Madras, not about Calcutta, which, you know, some of it, has, some of that has been recorded already, uh, but pretty much pan-Indian, and then the, the numbers in this communication to prove that. But uh, very few, few people know, for instance, and I, 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 I was in Hyderabad at the Lit Fest, where, uh, you know, that Lit Fest was devoted to Uriya, uh, uh, writers and intellectuals and so on. There's a group of them at that session. And so I actually asked how many of them knew that the capital of Katak was moved uh, from, Kat you know, uh, sorry, capital of Orissa was moved from Katak to Sambalpur. And not one of them did. So uh, similarly, the secretariat in Cochin was moved uh, to Trishur inland. So all these things are sort of emblematic of the panic that prevailed there. And, and this communication between the Orissa government, uh, governor and Lindutko saying, you know, if the Japanese come, uh, you know, Katak is going to be completely threatened because, you know, it's almost like an island in the Mahanadi and, and uh, exit points are, are, uh, are problematic. And so he's in a panic and he just says, I want to get out. And so he moves. Uh, the entire secretariat is moved. So there's stories like this which suggest that our obsession with Independence, um, you know, uh, uh, stories of Crips and its failure and uh, our quit India call and, and the arrests afterwards. Somewhere uh, uh, the attention on these events uh, looked at, uh, you know, looked at through the prism of, of, of sort of nationalism. Uh, the, the flap has got lost in this. Uh, so, and also you might argue that, uh, you know, it never happened, so it was a non-event. Uh, but I, 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 I tried, I tried to see that this was a. No, I tried to make a case that it was a non-event that actually impacted uh, us in may in ways that we've not probably fully recognized. Uh, of course, you might have known that the Madras Port Trust, which should have been by the sea, shifts to Uti of Correct. all places. Yeah. So during yeah. the flap, which yeah. is, I think, the far farthest away from an ocean. <laughs> yeah. So you're right. So Madras is the only city in India when actual advisory is issued saying, if you have no business here, leave. Um, Calcutta and Bombay, the governors of, Cal uh, you know, of the Bombay presidency and, and Bengal, are actually mulling over this saying, uh, issuing such an advisory. What they're worried about is essentially that if they issue such an advisory, then it'll be a good thing because a lot of, you know, uh, people that the British call inessentials or useless mouths or ineffectives will leave. But what uh, they're worried about in these two cities, because these are industrial centers, is that the people who are essential, are those engaged in war production, particularly uh, in Calcutta, they will leave too. So. For them, they actually tacitly encourage this ex exodus. Um, 
And that's another story in the, in the flap. And if you look at the communication uh, that Lin Lithua has, he says very much and quite flatly without, you know, not even a word of um, contractness that this is our policy. We want useless mouths. And he uses, uses the word useless mouths more than once. We want useless mouths to leave. But we need to find a way of keeping those we want here. So this is what essentially he has in mind. Madras issues that communicate at the end because of false information. Um, a southern command informs Hope that there is a huge naval fleet uh, that is going to make landfall in what is now uh, the coast of Tamil Nadu, south of Madras, around April 14th, and they change it to 15th. And uh, so they're saying this, the Japanese are going to be a full-fledged invasion. This is nonsense. Because by 15th, the, the Japanese, Nagumo and Ozama, already finished with the Indian Ocean of the Bay of Bengal, and they're going back because they have other battles to fight in the Pacific with the US, which is now regrouped and, and uh, is posing a challenge to Japan. So there's no threat at all, and this is completely wrong information. And so on this basis of the wrong information, he makes the government scatter. So you're right, um, the Port Trust goes, uh, the High Court goes to Coimbatore. Um, for the Tamil cases and the Telugu cases, they go to Anantapur, they're split. Um, the Accountant General Office comes to Bangalore, uh, Salem, I mean, all over, not just Uti. They're just all over, Madanapalli, they just move all over. There's Different. that very nice story about Sir Sidney Wadsworth and his wife Correct. sitting yeah. out in a car. They sat out in a car, and then uh, they go to Anantapur, the records haven't come, so they go up to this place called Horsley Hills, which is, uh, and they spend a lovely 15 days and they just drive back. Um, but that, you know, that's, the, 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 so the flap meant something quite different for a man of his uh, stature. But for many ordinary people, uh, um, I think it meant much more than that. My mother's family spent a whole year away. Um, you know, one whole year in Coimbatore before they came back. And uh, I, I, I learned that some people never came back. They just went back to their native places and didn't come back. So, You know, you talk about the flap in such evocative terms in the book, and yet you mentioned to me that the newspapers hardly covered it at that time. Yeah. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, well, um, I think Raghu there has also worked on it, and he's looked at the Hindu archives. Uh, maybe he'll bear this out, uh, maybe he won't, I don't know. I found, I mean, okay, just let's, 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 look at, um, let's look at the COVID, the exodus during COVID, and the kind of saturation coverage that it got. Um, if we look at the numbers uh, of people who fled uh, in 19, late 1941 and uh, early 1942, um, the COVID numbers pale in comparison. I mean, 17% of Calcutta fled in 17 days in late 41. 25% of Bombay was absent at one time. They were just empty, uh, you know, parts of Bombay just emptied out. Uh, almost all of Madras went. Vishakhapatnam was a ghost town. And Vishakhapatnam fled in January. Before January, 50 or 60% of the population of Vishakhapatnam had gone. So we're talking about huge numbers. And one would imagine that um, this would be reflected in more than small single columns, which say, uh, you know, uh, special trains are going to be run to, to let people go, and so on and so forth. So there was, no, uh, there was no human interest stories about the flap. And I looked not just at the Hindu, I looked at the statesman, I looked at the Indian Express, I looked at the mail, I looked everywhere. And, uh, there, there's, there's nothing beyond small reports and the odd editorial, usually in the British newspapers, the Mail and the Statesman. So I often wonder, and I just put this out there because there are other journalists in the audience uh, here, uh, that maybe we didn't do a kind of human interest journalism at that time. I mean, we might think of this, this was a golden age, uh, but maybe the journalism of that time focused more on, statesman, on statements, on press releases, on what it regarded as news. And people fleeing in such large numbers were, didn't make up news. Maybe we didn't do enough human interest reporting uh, at that time. That's what I think surprised me when I was researching this. There is more in the odd private diaries. Uh, so the British, you know, the story of the PLAF, essentially, if the two major sources, it's 
uh, Lin Lithu's secret communications and other communications with the governor and their replies, and in the private diaries of uh, British bureaucrats or, or Indian bureaucrats, Indy which Bhattar, uh, anyway, yeah. yeah, Jairam and others, which are lying in the British Library. So this has been essentially recreated, apart from the fortnightly reports and everything else, this has essentially been recreated from there. Uh, so I've tried to use very little of personal accounts, simply because you know, memory is unreliable, particularly when it's so far away. So I have not, uh, I mean, my mother's story is mentioned here, but uh, I've tried to avoid using uh, personal voices. So that brings us to sources. Uh, would you like to take us to, I mean, where you went in order well, to... Well, I first went to the Madras uh, archives, and, uh, you know, you go through the index, there's a geo on this, there's a geo on that, there's a geo on, for instance, on the animals uh, in Madras Zoo, there's a geo on, on evacuation, there's various geos. And then I kept asking, I want this, I want that, and I couldn't find a single document. They said... After a while, all the documents had been moved to the secretariat. So I actually went to the secretariat, went up to the public uh, secretary and said, look, uh, this is what the archives say. Uh, they say, sorry, we have no uh, documents here. So I drew almost a complete blank at the Madras archives. Um, As so many others have done. As so many others have done. Um, and so essentially, it was Delhi. Uh, it was... Uh, London, uh, the British Archives, and the National Archives at Kew. Uh, and, uh, you know, I s did spend quite some time there sort of furiously taking notes. And uh, also, I think, um, tapped into a couple of other sources. Uh, one, of the, one of the things, and I, I find this is not used enough, um, I, you know, I'm nobody here to lecture a proper historian, but there's a wealth of discussion in the Central Legislative Assembly and in the Council of States. And if you're looking at this period, then I think, uh, you know, the evacuation and everything else, th this, these are issues that come up uh, in the discussions at the time. And the great thing about it now is it's on online. You can, you can, you can, you can access them. So that was another source. Um, and I also did, and I found this also fascinating. There are little bits in the book, uh, the Corporation Archives of Madras, because uh, that's actually related, like a he said, she said, like a Hansard, you know, interventions. And it's quite remarkable that in Madras, um, in the 40s, um, there was just so much awareness of what was happening globally. Um, uh, Madras, well before the Japanese entered the war, donates uh, 10,000 rupees to Singapore the corporation of Madras, which is elected Indians, essentially. Some nominated uh, white people, but essentially the you know, elected body. Uh, donates money to um, Singapore saying, uh, we need, you know, you need to be secure from the Japanese, well before the Japanese even have attacked uh, Pearl Harbor or Malaya. So there's a lot of awareness um, and, and a lot of interesting discussion I found uh, in the Madras corporation. Some of this is mentioned here. So these are the various sources I looked at. And of course, uh, being in the press, um, I think um, uh, you know, I used a lot of newspapers, which was, I think, sometimes the most difficult and painful part, because you have to find these single columns in the middle of somewhere. But after a while, you learn to look at newsprint as well. Well, after Sponged. a while, you learn to look at you know, you know which page to turn to, uh, and then it becomes a little easier. So there was that as well. What about Japanese sources? Good question. Um, from what little I read, I mean, there is, there's some, uh, you know, two or three Japanese sources mentioned, but uh, you're right, by and large, um, you know, are, this is absent. Um, I gather that they, they destroyed a lot of it. This is what I read uh, when, uh, you know, before, before they surrendered. And whatever little that remained, and I'm not sure how uh, relevant that is, uh, that was then taken to the United States for a while and then... Uh, I believe there's some discussion. I, I'm not aware of this fully, but this is what I read. Um, there is some record of uh, Ozawa's operations in, uh, in the Bay of Bengal, uh, because it's a part of shipping, um, you know, uh, 
my uh, military shipping history and i've referred to that uh, i've used that to decide that okay maybe it's this merchant ship he sank at this time rather than something else just by deduction uh, but you're right um, there is very little in the book uh, about um, you know japanese intent or you know this is what we set out to do um, and it's not there well, i don't think it's been done before whatever little i've read on the fab i have not read japanese sources so if it's out there somewhere i think somebody should be looking at it yeah the uh, there are two parallel threads one is of the war and the flap and everything and the other is gandhi bose nehru uh, would you like to comment on it because particularly in the light of what you have written uh, yeah so i try to analyze the impact of of uh, of the war on the nationalist movement i mean starting with 1939 when lindithgo declares india uh, at war as soon as britain declares it's at war uh, with germany after poland uh, lindithgo sits in simla and then he gets on all india radio and says india is at war too and the congress of course is very miffed because they're not being consulted and so on so that's one uh, section of this uh but i try to suggest that as the war progresses uh the congress gets deeply divided um and you know bose of course the story of bose everyone knows um you know he's sidelined in the congress he goes away to germany and then finally gets to japan and then he i'll just uh, it was news to me that bose was not the founder of the ina it's only on reading oh, yeah. your book that well, i yeah yeah bose I, you know i always thought that he was the man yeah yeah, yeah. no no he wasn't i mean it was uh, pritham singh mohan singh uh, and then uh, rashpihari bose after mohan singh falls out of the japanese rashpihari bose who was a part of the gadar movement is recalled from uh, japan and then asked to take it over but by then the japanese know that this is a holding operation for bose bose is already in germany uh, he's in berlin and uh, then he you know gets to japan and then finally comes to singapore but by the time he declares you know the provisional government of free india and you know uh, he declares war on the bose declares war on the united states and britain rather grandly uh, from singapore um the japanese we bengalis are like that <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'll duck that one but uh, uh but he's the japanese are not the naval power that they were in 42 they ruled the waves you know churchill you, you know there's passages about churchill just saying you know this japan has just a free run of the waves but <clears throat> by the middle of 42 after the battles of the coral sea and midway uh, the uns us has kind of neutralized the japanese army so yes they are in possession of territory uh, but they're not the force that were and so when they finally attack india in 1944 Uh, i know that they were you know the battle of kohima was you know, the british regarded it as one of their major victories and so on uh, but they essentially fighting a force that has already been considered considerably weakened by that time so i don't get into that part of it i only deal with uh, the beginning which is 1942 sorry i think i've missed no, your question gandhi and nehru we yeah. uh, <clears throat> so nehru is quite clear nehru is ideological uh, he is um, against the axis powers uh, to them and particularly after you know hitler attacks uh, the soviet union uh, nehru by nature is is left uh, and uh, so he is quite clear that his heart is with the allies uh, gandhi soon after was declared goes he supposedly sobs in you know when he meets lindetko uh saying uh, you know he can't imagine um, a ruined parliament building in westminster because he studied there as a student um uh, so his sympathies seem to be with britain but as the war progresses um uh, and this is again uh, some an issue i deal with he is accused by people uh, including uh, um Nehru's biographer and Gopal, uh, Gopal and including um, including um, you know not accused or is at least he said to be uh, sympathetic or at least he believes that Japan will win the war and uh, there are people like Azad Maulana Azad and and others and and Nehru himself uh, 
has said this at one meeting, um, that uh, Gandhi, see, Gandhi was an ideological man, Nehru was. I mean, he saw this in terms of this. He also, in his eyes, there was a moral equivalence between aggression and counter-aggression. So I didn't th think he saw Nazi, you know, for, and he was telling Linutu all the time that if you counter-attack, you're as bad as the Nazis, you know. Uh, for him, the response to aggression was sort of passive violence. He was telling all kinds of people, Abyssinians, Jews, give your lives up. He was telling Britons, give up your homes, you know, let Hitler take your land. Uh, so which the Congress found, uh, or at least large sections of the Congress found completely in impractical advice at that time. So there was that, uh, the fact that he saw this in less ideological terms than Nehru did. He also believed, I think, um, that Japan was willing the war. Cripps thought he did. Wavell thought he did. Nehru has suggested this. Ada definitely thought he did. And so he ends up being accused of being pro-Japanese. Or in fact, Gopal actually says he adopts a pro-Japanese position. And he then writes uh, in uh, in the Harijan, and um, you know. Uh, why he's not pro-Japanese. He's forced to defend himself and, you know, things like that. But Gandhi does change his position in the end. And this is, again, something that I don't see in a lot of nationalist writing on it. Gandhi is saying, I'm not going to support this war because any support of this war is a form of violence. Nehru is saying, we'll support the war, but not as slaves. Give us independence. Uh, Rajaji is saying something else because he goes to another extreme and I'll leave that out for the moment. And of course, Bose is with the Japanese. So this is how uh, structures out. But Gandhi towards the end and does a little bit of U-turn. In fact, he explains saying that all of you may be surprised doing this, so this is there. He allows uh, international troops. He says, I'm okay with international troops being on Indian soil. So, uh, and then of course, um, you know, uh, Mr. Shankar Sikh actually writes to Nehru saying, you must have really worked on him to do this. And Gandhi then tries to explain why he's had this change of heart, not very convincingly. Uh, because his position all along was, look, if the British go, the Japanese won't attack us. They have no, they, 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 they've got a problem with you, not with us. And he actually goes as far at one time of trying to draft a resolution saying, we have no problem with Japan. We're willing to negotiate with them, which horrifies Nehru. And then that draft resolution is worked on a couple of times, and then Nehru's hand, you know, it's changed. So this, this is another aspect which uh, I think probably needs to be studied a little further, the fact that the war did actually divide the Congress. It brought them all together in the end, all under Gandhi at the end, because... Uh, you know, suddenly in '42, he's asked the British to go. I mean, he's the most moderate congressman, and, and Bose is upset with him that, you know, has been upset with him that he's not pushing the British out. Nehru is impatient. He's not willing to call mass satyagraha because he says, I don't want to embarrass the British because they're fighting a war at this time. And suddenly in '42, he's changed. And some people think he's changed because in 42, around the middle of 42, I mean, it was in August that Quit India call takes place. But by May, he's starting to get a little more aggressive in his statements, a little more direct, saying, you know, I think the British should go. And the big question is whether this has to do with a belief that the Japanese would win the war or not. I put it there as, as a possibility uh, that can't be discounted uh, because uh, we don't have the proof on this. Last couple yeah, of sorry. questions. Uh, uh, one is... Where did Jinnah come into all this? Well, I mean, Lindit Kaur was softer to Jinnah during the war. I mean, you know, there were there were sections of our polity that uh, that uh, were sort of broadly supportive of Britain and, and the war effort. So I deal essentially with the Congress. I felt uh, that was uh, that was my interest at the moment. I mean, I don't deal with uh, some of the other parties that were broadly supportive of the British war effort. Uh, yeah. Looking back at uh, the all characters, I mean, you know, yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't mention Ambedkar, for instance, because Ambedkar joins Vilinda Kaur's uh, the Viceroy's Council in yeah. '41, so I don't get into that kind of space. Mm -hmm. 
looking back and considering the fact now that there are two wars raging at different places, do you think the flap has any lesson for all of us as a world at large? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a big question. I think it needs a <laughs> better <laughs> mind than mine to answer it. Uh, but I, to me, I think it, it sort of establishes that non-events are events too in history, and they can influence the course of history. Um, and I think my entire attempt in this book is to show that, uh, you know, how a non-event played out um, and how it, uh, I mean, and that, that I mean, there's, there's a sort of dystopian kind of futility to the whole thing. I mean, imagine an entire town evacuating and nothing happening after that. Yeah? Or imagine a capital shifting where the Japanese have already gone away. Uh, so there's stories like this. And they're, they're bizarre stories in the flap, and some, sometimes it's almost fictional. I mean, there is this one story, if you'll give me a minute, I'll, I'll mention, because I was just delighted when I found this in the British Library, um, thanks to the private papers of, of uh, one ICS official uh, who's in Delhi. And the brother of the poet, W.H. Auden, um, uh, who's a geologist, and a Bhatnakar, who then becomes a big cheese in the Indian scientific uh, establishment, they go to him and they say, look, we've manufactured this black uh, with this substance. And if you burn the substance, it will cloud your important buildings with black smoke. So Japanese cannot spot this. And this is in Delhi. And this is when there is absolutely no threat of Delhi being bombed, simply because a bomber cannot take off, or any fighter cannot take off from Singapore, Malaya, come all the way to Delhi and go back. Uh, there was no technology that allowed it at that time. The tanks weren't big enough. So they actually say, okay, do it. So around Army HQ, which is South Block, they put these little braziers and they burn this black tarry Army substance. <laughs> and it's a complete washout. And so, <laughs> so there's stories like this which are just emblematic of the panic. And to me, uh, you know, uh, they're just as interesting... Uh, and they're revealing of, of people. Uh, you know, the British who fled, uh, the, the Americans who just fled Kote Canal in panic. Kote Canal? 300 Americans sort of rush one day in complete panic, thinking that the Japanese will attack, attack, attack Kote Canal. And it's, it's, the story is again, got lost somewhere. It's thanks to an editorial in the mail and some little thing somewhere else that, you know, one has been able to uh, piece this together. But... Uh, so that's, you know, it's stories that, like this that, that, that sort of interested me in the idea. I think there's sort of a rich vein of stories like this, almost fictional stories. Um, and that's one side. And the more serious side, and uh, those were the two chapters that took me the longest to write. Um, I write fairly quickly, so it doesn't take me too long. But those two chapters actually took me quite some time to write, which were the political chapters, because I didn't want to make a mistake and I didn't want to get something wrong on an area that's just been so much of writing, the nationalist movement and so on. So, so there's one side, which is, I think, a, a sort of slightly more serious side to uh, the book, uh, which is the political side. And there's slightly more fictional side about all this crazy stuff that happened in India, which we seem to have forgotten about. Including the killing of animals. Including the killing of animals in Madras Zoo, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's Thank you so much, Mukun. Thank you very much. I think he's yeah. open now to questions. Raghu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Raghu's written uh, this fantastic book. I mean, I'm just telling somebody who may not know. Uh, on this very same uh, period, uh, but of, of course, uh, it's, it's much better written. But it's uh, it's it's sort of uh, deals with his family uh, at that time, and it's slightly different in its approach. I think he calls it forensic nonfiction at one place. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much. I, my book was about India during World War II. Thank you. Yeah, my book was about India during World War II, and I. The chapter that I think I loved the most, uncovering that the, the 
the, surpri the, the piece that surprised me the most probably was the discovery that Madras was evacuated because the characters I'm following found themselves in Madras in 1942. And it struck me right then that this is the story. This is, if there's anything that symbolizes how much we've forgotten about Indian history in that period, it is the flap. So congratulations on writing the Thank book you. about the flap. That's such great, uh, it's such a good contribution. Um, the question that always, that, that always stayed with me, because you're right, I, I, didn't, I didn't find any trove of yeah, research. I remember you saying it. that at the Hindu Lit Fest, that you looked and couldn't, you, you, you thought there was a dearth of material. Yeah, Madras Maybe. Musings was, the, was my richest okay. source on the subject. Yeah. Um, there was very little in the newspapers, as you said. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I always wondered what non-English sources might retain about it. Uh, whether there was any writing in Tamil. After, maybe a few years later, <coughs> recalling it. And I don't know whether, <coughs> whether that so, was something you could look into. Yeah, good question. Um, so I looked at, I mean, there is there are a couple of references. There's the <coughs> the, the sort of the writer Pudmai Pitan who, who who's um, who's written a story about this. There's also his diaries, which I mentioned. His wife goes away. Uh, I mean, like, you know, one of the things about the Exodus is uh, almost invariably, what, irrespective of which city, it's the women and children who are sent away first, and then the men follow later. So his wife goes away somewhere in the south, in Ambasamudram, and so he's writing to her. So this diary uh, records some of the, uh, you know, the atmosphere in Madras, white soldiers, blackouts, stuff like that. The A.K. Chetia has written this piece, which is also mentioned there. I looked at some newspapers, Anand Vikad and others, um, and some Tamil publications, but, um, there's fairly routine, um, you know, news events. Um, I couldn't find anything like um, a sort of heartfelt story of, uh, okay, this was the trouble I went through. And this is not surprising. I mean, you know, the flap, in a way, is, is uh, maybe is not as big as the Great March or not as traumatic as the so-called the, the, the Long March, uh, the Forgotten Long March, uh, to use... Uh, um, you Tinker's expression, where about 400 to 500,000 people walked from Burma all the way to India, Calcutta and down. And how many people recorded that? I mean, he himself mentions that, um, you know, uh, there's some bits here and there, but you need to struggle to find uh, actual records of the, the deaths, the disease, the, 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 the starvation, the robberies, uh, the, the sort of harrowing uh, march that it was. And people who came, but then, you know, they came to Madras, they came to Bombay, they, they, uh, they first landed up in Calcutta, of course, and then they were shipped all over. And uh, we, have, we, don't, we don't have a proper book of somebody who set this, set this to this thing. So I think we're pretty bad uh, with record keeping. And uh, so the Brits are far better than us. So even, even the one surviving story of... Uh, uh, a, a merchant salesman who, who sort of gets shot by the Japanese in the Bay of Bengal, uh, Stanley Salt, uh, he's British, um, so it's there. So I couldn't, you know, good question, but, um, uh, you know, uh, people have, there are lots of people who come to me with memories, but they don't know when they left. They don't know how long they stayed. Like my father remembers, for instance, my father's family left too. He went to Velour, but he doesn't know where they stayed in Bello, they took a rented house. He doesn't know how long they were away. Um, the memories are dim. So actually, the flap should have been written about 30 years earlier, I think. Maybe there would have been more voices in it if it was written then. It's very interesting because uh, a couple of, uh, you know, I think five or even eight years ago, in one of the Madras Week celebrations, we wanted to have a Burma evening. And we were wanting people uh, with memories of... Uh, uh, life in Burma and about how they walked back. We couldn't find a single individual. And uh, Mr. M. V. Subaya of the Murugapa group, he was the only person uh, who could give a second-hand account because his father had been killed in Burma. Uh, he was shot dead in Burma uh, immediately after the Second World War. And it was a second-hand account because he, you know, he didn't have any personal memory of it. He could only give us a recitation. 
but uh, as Mukund very rightly says, even the Chetiyars themselves, who were probably the worst affected in that long march coming back, they have not recorded it. And, and all the Chetiyars who knew something about it have died. So there's nothing much left. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Hello, I am Maroon Swaminathan. I bought your book out of sheer curiosity. And I must compliment you because there's a family connection. My father's air raid precaution warden badges with me. I've seen his helmet also. And he was in 41, 42, an ARP warden. And he writes to his sister. I've seen a copy of the letter, Leela, who, who went out of Madras. And the lonely vigils on the Adyar beach looking out for the Japanese aircraft coming in. And he's still a young chap. He's studying in presidency. So there was a lot of enthusiasm from his side in that letter. The second thing comes that when the bombing took place, there were three things within the family. My father was in Lahore in the uh, services selection board. He joined the, uh, he got commissioned in 44. So he missed the bombing. His brother was in a hospital near Buckingham Canal and he heard the explosion. My grandfather, who was in Theosophic Society, used to get provisions for the society as a volunteer worker. He was returning, crossing the Adyar River when he heard the explosion. The fourth family story I wanted to share with you, which is very amusing, is one of my uncles, whose father was, the, was an ICS officer. In his house, I have actually seen in a glass encased wooden platform and co beautiful copper plate lettering on brass with compliments from Hirohito, a fragment of a Japanese bomb, which fell near their house in Calcutta. Now, the quick question I wanted to ask you is about the first time I knew about Rajaji's involvement of, with the various other levels, as you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I, I deal with ARP quite a bit because, uh, just briefly, I, I know it's not um, you know, directly related to question, but one of the things that triggered a lot of pra uh, panic was ARP measures. And ARP measures are essentially passive defensive measures. Uh, so you have blackouts, uh, you have all kinds of other restrictions, your window panes get closed, you dig slick slit trenches. Now, arguably, the British took this much too far, much too early. So when Governor Hope comes to Madras, for instance, He's wondering why lighting restrictions are in place. He says, you know, one of the first things I'm going to do is to get rid of them. And then, of course, he changes his mind because of some other development that happens in Europe, military development. Uh, 114 miles of slit trenches are dug in Calcutta and its surrounding areas. Miles and miles are dug in Madras. Uh, houses are commandeered for, for slit trenches. All this adds to the panic. So, you know, this is uh, something I, 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 I detail in the book. Because one of the demands in India is, hey, you have all these passive defensive measures in place. You know, if a plane comes, get into a slit trench, um, you know, sort of board your windows. And, you know, there are all these measures that you take, drills, ARP drills, and so on that people go through. Uh, but you're not arming us. And so this is a refrain that, um, uh, you know, that plays out in India quite a bit. And plays out not only amongst Indian. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, the statesman, which was actually a remarkable voice at that time, despite being British, is extremely critical of uh, 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 the British government's um, um, unwillingness to sort of, sort of to defend India uh, firmly. So, you know, it, it sort of criticizes, uh, you know, Britain is looking inward, it says, looking at defending its own island rather than its uh, empire in a way, but defending India. Um, so, yeah, good question and thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for the absolutely nice talk. And I wanted to ask, so the Japanese did a lot of propaganda work on Pearl Harbor, how they were going to bomb it, connecting it with Japanese folklore. Did they do a similar thing with the invasion of Southeast Asia and Burma? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are, there, are, there, are, there are passages in this. In fact, the, uh, the British are extremely worried about uh, the success, not, on, not only of Japanese propaganda, but the propaganda coming from Berlin. 
uh, because BIRS is in Berlin, and you know, there's Free, in, uh, Free India Radio, Azad Hind Radio uh, that he's speaking on. And once the Japanese take uh, Southeast Asia, their transmitters in, in, in uh, uh, Singapore and, and uh, uh, other places that are beaming stuff into India. And uh, there are complaints, in fact, in official um, uh, communication between British officials that look, uh, uh, when people go to buy a radio set, in, and, and radio sets were not available in such large numbers, but when people went to buy radio sets, first question people would ask is, can I listen to Radio Berlin on this, or can I listen to Japan? Not whether I can listen to the BBC. And uh, the British are so worried about this that they actually uh, co-opt uh, a left-wing opponent of the war uh, who they don't see eye to eye with at all, an anti-imperialist, a uh, writer like George Orwell. And Orwell is actually hired to do India broadcasts. So he does a news broadcast, and he does what is a literary broadcast aimed at intellectuals. So they are extraordinarily worried uh, by, the, um, by the, you know, the war in the ether, as it were. Um, and so there is uh, stuff on this in the book. Um, and the Japanese are, are fairly successful at spreading propaganda, because some of the rumors also have a sort of propagandistic ring, right? It's about Japanese bravery and about British cowardice. And there are all kinds of wild rumors. There's this rumor about a Japanese guy who comes in a parachute down, addresses some meeting in Bihar in some village, and then goes back in the same parachute back to the plane. <laughs> and the people who believe this, and these are actually recorded in, um, in, in, in communications uh, to this. The, the police commissioner in Calcutta has to put out a press statement saying, look, I've not been arrested. Because the rumor in Calcutta is he's been arrested for being sort of an Irish retarder of the war effort. And he's not even Irish, he's a Scot. So there are crazy stuff happening. All kinds of wild rumors are sort of, you know, of, uh, of gold and wealth and, and all kinds of things uh, uh, playing out at that time. And there are all kinds of other fears. There's fears about white uh, soldiers which and rape. Uh, some incidents which uh, were true, some incidents which were exaggerated. There are all kinds of other fears. So the more military people come in, Jamshedpur, for instance, there's a massive evacuation because they feel that Tata Steel, which is the at that time the biggest uh, uh, steel-making uh, unit of the British Empire, actually could be a target of the Japanese. So the moment they move in their aircraft, um, anti-aircraft guns with gunners, uh, there's panic in the factory and the workers flee. And then they have to find a way of, of trying to, uh, you know, uh, get them back and so on. So there's, 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 there's propaganda, there's rumor, there's, there's false stories. Everything is sloshing around in the flat. That's a wonderful talk. I just want to share some uh, experience. My family, including myself, were evacuated from Chennai, from Madras. Um, before I go to that, I just want to, uh, since you mentioned about the literature references and so on, I want to bring your attention to the fact that the famous uh, movie Parashakti, Correct. Is Shivaji Ganesan's first movie, starts with the end point of that long march from Ragun. Correct. He lands from Rangoon and gets into all the problems. And the other one, where there is another very called Andanal. If you recall, the hero actually turns out to be a Japanese spy. Correct. Based in uh, Chennai and transmitting all kinds of messages and uh, his wife shoots him <laughs> for that. Um, the family uh, was My father was uh, an engineer in the public works department in Chennai, Metros, and um, with a large family of children, and he put us all on in, uh, in the Tirunelveli Express. Tirunelveli is where we are rooted, so he sent them off. I could have argued with him because uh, Tirunelveli is closer to the Tutukut coast. And <laughs> but I was in no position to argue that because I was inside my mother. 
we but i have heard a lot about the evacuation the word evacuation is very common the evacuation time and the evacuation was a, and that kind of a thing is very commonly used and uh, one of the things that um, my mother has told me after I grew up into school stage and so on that the some kind of a reconnaissance planes of japanese used to fly over Ch madras and drop leaflets and she remembers in order to cover themselves they used to drop leaflets printed with uh, uh, pierce soap something i don't know what the connection is either they were decoys or what i have no idea yeah. but my mother has told me that if they were disguised themselves yeah. advertisement for pierce soap and uh, perhaps pierce may not have been involved but but pierce soap was deeply available was very strongly entrenched in madras all this of course i wasn't i was like many many people i was also looking for some bomb shots and shell shots in the fort st george i didn't find it but i found it in vaisak of course which is the but the madras took the shots in yep and first yeah thank you thank you fascinating um uh, it's not a question i just wanted to share a small memory uh my grandfather apparently was the minister of civil supplies during the war in uh, madras and he had a huge family of uh, seven children so my mother constantly used to tell me about the war and how you know they had these um, places where you could you have to go and hide and there would be the siren which announced the bomb is going to fall and i think for her as a young kid it was more an excitement than <laughs> you know actual fear of anything and that uh, apparently the even the bomb shelters would be properly well stacked and all that so uh, there were a lot of stories told by my mother and her siblings about the war and how they and finally they were of course they had to be evacuated even though my grandfather held a good post he just bundled them all off and sent them back to mysore because we belong to karnataka similarly my father in law who was working in uh, uh chennai at that time uh, he he was uh, holding a kind of administrative post with tatas he was not a great writer or anything but somehow this whole evacuation thing lived with him for so long i'm a journalist so one day he suddenly told me amma i want to write about the time that we i went through this evacuation and he wanted to write about how it was to be a man all alone in chennai after he sent all his nine children and why i don't think he had nine children at that time i think he had only five or six but his wife all of them were sent off to manargudi which was their town and they lived there and my husband remembers going to the village school at that time you know the first school he went to was a village school where they wrote on the ground the alphabet and coming from uh, uh madras which was at that time a very cosmopolitan town for them to suddenly be sent to a village was very uh, good and bad at the same time they enjoyed village life but you know the whole thing nobody ever thought about it and said why was it such a useless exercise you know i think most of the people who told me about this were those who enjoyed going back and then coming back to madras after some time and they never thought too much about it but i think the whole evacuation took about a year or two out of the lives of all the people then you know even for my mother in law used to talk about going to manargudi and having to manage and having to deliver a child there in a new place so it was i don't know though i think it threw several lives upside down even though they may not have actually experienced the war it's just just a memory i wanted to share thank you geeta thank you uh, so okay hello uh, you see okay 
one of the lead indicators of panic is money, money and finance. So paper money, silver, gold, interest rates. So any insights upon, uh, on, on, that, on that front? You know, the, did paper money go at a discount? Uh, what, 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 the, the silver markets were cornered, and et cetera. Uh, any insights on that? This is one question. Second question is, was the Japanese narrative uh, couched as liberators against British imperialism? Yeah, so, so the, second uh, question, the second question first. So um, uh, the Japanese had a, it was very much a part of what they saw as their foreign policy, uh, which is to liberate, it was, they called it Asia for the Asians. I mean, they had this uh, uh, concept called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. So they were taking out the colonial powers, the, the Dutch, the British, from, from this area, and uh, ostensibly they were liberating uh, them. But at the same time, uh, they probably saw themselves at the head of this table in a way, you know, because, you know, they were exploiting, um, uh, you know, resources in, in Malaya and Singapore and so on. Uh, so this idea of a greater East Asia crow prosperity sphere was sort of undefined in a way. It started coming out and then it was used to include India in a while. So it was a, a muddle kind of concept. But this, they had this word, I forget the Japanese word for it, somewhere in the book, uh, that it's their living space. You know, it's, so they saw it in some way as, 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 as a part of their living space, this area. Okay. So it's like, the yeah, so, um, and they, they, there are reasons to believe that, you know, uh, uh, that, they, that, that in a world which seemed you know, uh, that would be, uh, that Hitler would control parts of it, then Japan wanted to control certain other parts of it. But these parts, not, not the West. So uh, I think very much, um, very much a part of, part of policy. Um, uh, and, but I don't think they planned to invade and conquer India. I don't think that was, that, quite clearly they didn't want to do that. They just wanted to create trouble, uh, send messages that the British were incapable of ruling India. Um, I think they didn't, at any stage, uh, had they not planned a, a full-scale full invasion of India. That was uh, the second question. The first was, had to do with, um, sorry. Gold and money and... Well, there were, there were scarcities. There were huge scarcities. I mean, there were scarcities of different things at different times. Uh, you know, by 43, uh, a little later, to the end of 42, you had the famine. Uh, in Bengal. I don't get into that beyond mentioning it because I didn't think it was a part of uh, the remit of this book. But um, there were scarcities of all kinds, there were scarcities of firewood. The war just pushed uh, things into this. And you've heard the stories, right? The South Indians never ate rava dosa till the rice ran out and during the World War II and so people invented the rava dosa and maybe the rava upma as well. So you've had, you know, you did these folk stories about all kinds of scarcities that, that play out during the war at that time. And uh, the British are constantly looking to raise money for the war effort. I mean, in every communication, there are fortnightly reports that were uh, sent out by the chief secretaries of provinces to the home secretary. Every report would have an update on how much the so-called war fund has increased by. And this was the thing to boast that I've, you know, we've, we've, we've collected so much. So there was this enormous uh, drain of, of money that went into the British war effort at that time. Sonia. Yeah. Mukund. Uh, I think uh, since I've come to a couple of these talks, I feel like sometimes it gets missed out on the, on the craft of writing the, the book itself, you know? Like so many questions and so much is about the history and the facts. But the fact that you've been able to piece together you know, fiction and a real event in history. So how was the craft of writing itself, like in you being a journalist, and what was the process of, you know, putting that kind of wit and humor to a very, very sort of a serious but non-serious event, and you sort of really captured this, this storytelling of, 
of these events, you know, from whether it's the political or it's the social. And I think that itself needs some bit of time and reflection because I think that as a historical writing becomes very interesting for a reader who's not just looking at your work from, say, you know, finding facts and finding something that happened in the past, but actually it's a historical narrative. And I think the narrative has come together because of the kind of tempo that you've brought in in your writing. So would you like to comment on that as well a little bit? Uh, well, I'll try. Um, I think what I wanted to do was, uh, was to recreate a sense of time and place. Uh, so, and I think if the stories help to do that, then I, 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 I narrated those stories. So there's a part of the book which is narrative nonfiction. Uh, and there's a wealth of material. I mean, there's, you know, there are rumors, there uh, are there, strange things, there are, uh, you know, as I mentioned about uh, uh, the burning of the braziers in Delhi, there are all kinds of, of crazy things that happened at that time. So there's a wealth of almost fiction-like stories to be told. So that's one side of it. At the same time, and I don't know whether I've succeeded in it, it's up, for, up to readers to do it, uh, I wanted this to have the heft of a sort of researched piece of history. Um, you know, this is a piece that, that, I mean, I've spent many, many hours in libraries looking at primary sources. Uh, I especially left out memories of people because those memories are not, um, you know, they're memories. They're not exactly, um, you, there's some things you can't corroborate. So I've tried to write it as, as close, as closely and as, uh, you know, uh, with as much rigor as I could put into it. And I hope uh, the narrative elements, which people have found very interesting, um, do not detract or have not detracted uh, from, from the heft of uh, what I hope is there in the book in some way. Um, and I hope that at least um, that some of the stories there have, I've, I have not read a history book which says that, uh, you know, the capital of Varissa moved to Sambalpur. I haven't read it of that period. And there's some historians who've written about this period and they're wonderful historians. Um, so I hope this has stories that have not been related. I hope at one level it captures a sense of time and place and if I've managed to do that in a, in a sort of convincing and engaging f fashion, um, then I, 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 I think, thank you, I have succeeded then. Uh, but more importantly, I think it does make points about the nationalist movement and the war and, I've, um, and I hope uh, there is an underlying seriousness about the book uh, and the wit and the, um, you know, uh, to use your expression, there are some jokes and there are some funny stories. Don't take away from that in some way. I've tried, I've tried to maintain a kind of balance. Um, whether I've succeeded or not is, is really up to the reader to judge. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Mukun for your uh, valuable insights. So uh, when we look at the Japanese war history and how um, they were very infamous for the massacres in Nanjing, uh, in Manchuria, and, and the fact that they were constantly conquering the Pacific Islands, they were constantly con conquering Southeast Asia, and once they reached Malaya, Saigon, the Philippines, uh, there was panic which was setting into the uh, British, British Raj as well. And the fact that even in your book you have mentioned how these cities, they st started getting evacuated, the British chose to shift a lot of capitals. Do you think at, at a point the British actually felt threatened with the, uh, you know, the Japanese admiration for the Indian people, especially their admiration towards Gandhi and whether there could be a turn in, in, in the uh, mindset of the Congress as well where the Considering the massive population that the British Raj had, would, would that have been, uh, you know, devastating uh, for the war efforts of the British Raj as well, in case the population chose to turn against uh, the British effort in the war? After the war? During the war. Yeah, well, I think the British were constantly worried about this. I mean, one of the things that the British are constantly telling the Indians is, look, the Japanese are not who you think they are. Look at Nanjing, you know. Look at what they're doing in China. 
they're not going to be nice to you. Uh, Japanese propaganda, of course, is all about something else. It's all about you know, liberating India from the Chinese work. There are a whole lot of posters, there are a whole lot of uh, uh, propaganda that, that is put out by them to this effect, that essentially they're liberators. Um, and I think the British are worried. Um, and I think one of the things, I mean, you know, uh, it's, there's this big debate about independence and, you know, who contributed what to it, which I think is, is, is a sort of a kind of dead end because I, I don't think this can be weighed, um, you know, saying so-and-so contributed so much and so-and-so didn't. But I think one of the things that happened with the birth of the INA, and this is not a pre-Bos, uh, pre-Subash Bos, is that I think it made the British realize that if, this, if the circumstances are right, then the, to hold the Indian army down would be difficult. And that realization uh, was something that you know, would have had lots of repercussions on the British political mind. Because almost everyone, or everyone left for the Japanese at that time. Mm -hmm. And there were other things happening at that time. So Bose, I mean, you might argue that, okay, he came into India and, you know, he failed and, and they were pushed back. And they, but uh, the INA were popular. They were so popular that you know, when these three men, Segal and Shanavas, were tried, uh, you know, Nehru signed up to be their lawyer. Um, and, uh, you know, take the naval mutiny in Bombay in 1946. I mean, these were things that it's hard to contribute in terms of, you know, weight, give weightage. Uh, but certainly, I think the realization that uh, if you can't hold the army, then you can't hold India is something that definitely uh, played out. Uh, and I think uh, the, the flap or the, the events of 1942 uh, suggested that uh, it might be more and more difficult to hold the army. And this was an army that had changed. You know, the war had just, the army had just expanded exponentially. And so there were many more Indians in it. So suddenly from a sort of, uh, you know, from lim limited to martial races and, and so on, the Indian army was speaking a babel of tongues. There were, there were, there were people from all over the country. There were commissioned officers uh, who were Indian. Um, so that's a harder lot to contain and to control. So I think there was some realization there as well. I'm not taking any, anything away from the Congress and and its leaders, but I think um, this also can't be discounted as a possible reason for uh, the British also maybe saying, okay, maybe we can't hold India forever. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, of course, first of all, absolutely fascinating, uh, the way the questions and the way everything's gone. Uh, I was just thinking of communications back then and how people heard things and did things. My question is, if there had been social media then, what would have happened? <laughs> I have no idea. We would have probably had fact checkers, so maybe they would have called out rumors a little earlier. I, I don't really know, but you know, wars have been a playground for rumors, so that, that much is there. So it's not surprising that there were rumors. It's just that the British had to battle with these pro-Japanese rumors all the time. There were all kinds of weird rumors, you know. Oh, the Japanese came into Burma. Um, uh, they didn't uh, bomb a Buddhist temple because they respected Buddhism. All kinds of things like that were, were... And the British had the biggest problem with this kind of rumor. Rumors that uh, suggested that the Japanese uh, saw Indians in a kindly light. And the Japanese did go some way in trying to portray that. And there's a story in the book. You know Segal, um, Prem Segal, who marries, um, who's married to Lakshmi, uh, who leads the Rani of Jansi Regiment in Burma under Bose. Uh, Lakshmi was a Madras resident. And, and uh, uh, he, Segal's her, her husband. And Segal is actually in Singapore. Uh, he doesn't sign up to the INA immediately, but he's captured. He's, Somewhere there, and when the Japanese take over, he's captured. And uh, he's taken uh, somewhere, and uh, there's a Japanese guy who's, you know, takes out a pistol. He's asked to kneel. Uh, so he thinks he's going to be shot. And then the, there's a Japanese guy. He pulls out a sword, and he says, okay, maybe he thinks I'm not worth wasting a bullet on. 
And then he looks around and there's a British officer who's next to him, also kneeling, and he chops off the British officer's head in front of him. And this uh, shaken Segal is then um, asked a question, you know, are you in Japanese, which suggests, are you a Gandhian or do you, do you know Gandhi? And he manages, manages to understand something, he gets it wrong, he gets slapped, but then he manages to get the question right. And then he's actually invited to have omelets and brandy or something by the Japanese colonel. So the treatment meted out to Indians was very, very different from the treatment that they meted out, uh, say, to the Chinese in, and, and to the uh, British and Australians uh, that they captured. So by and large, I mean, there's a controversy on this. If you read history, you'll get uh, uh, different historians, you get different views on it. But I think there's no doubt that the British and uh, the Japanese in Southeast Asia um, sort of treated Indians with, well, not kid gloves perhaps, but relatively softer than they treated the others. And that also contributed to this idea that they didn't look on us uh, as badly as uh, the British did. Yeah, right. Hello, uh, short question. Did the Japanese ever get to know about the Great Flap? <laughs> the Great Flap? <laughs> well, I think they, they uh, I don't know if they knew the expression because the Great Flap uh, is an expression used uh, by bureaucrats and in certain you know, private papers and so on. Um, so I, you know, you come across it more than once, the great flap. Um, but I think they certainly want to create the flap, which is why they came and they took down merchant shippings. They wanted to create uh, a situation where, uh, you know, the Indians would feel that the British were no longer capable of governing them. And I think they succeeded to some extent in doing that, despite having no plans to invade India. Uh, they did a lot of bombing. So they bombed, the first cities that were bombed were Vishakapatnam and Kokonada. This was Ozawa's, uh, you know, they took off from the Ryujo in the Bay of Bengal and bombed those two places. I think it was April 5th, if I remember right. Um, and then um, the Northeast. And one of the other things about the flap is that, again, uh, maybe it's written somewhere, I don't know this, but the bombings were, you know, by the ruinous standards of World War II, they were not great. But there were many, many sorties flown into the Northeast. I mean, Calcutta, the bombing in Calcutta, we know something about Kedapur docks, the number of people who died, and so on and so forth. But they bombed Impal, they bombed Manipur. And so the flap consumed the Northeast. There were people who fled from there as well. And so they bombed uh, Chittagong, uh, was bombed some 10, 14 times. So these records of these bombings are actually there in queue. Uh, you know, the, the number of times that they bombed India during that time. But they bombed essentially infrastructure, and they didn't bomb to invade. It was just to create trouble here and there. They were in northern Burma. They could just fly out. And they knew that, you know, India wasn't well defended uh, at that time. Yes. Uh, uh, hi, Mukun. I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, what's the rationale behind the panic in provinces on the West Coast? Were there any incidents or like bombings of the cities on the West Coast? On the West Coast? Yeah. Well, the Times of India reports that, uh, you know, the Times of India actually has a story um, which is unusual about uh, how restaurants are shuttered and, and uh, their entire roads which are empty and, uh, you know, uh, flats or whatever, apartment blocks that are shuttered and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so, uh, and, you know, we know that the governor is very, very worried that if, if the Japanese invade um, uh, Bombay, the exit points in Bombay are, are he says, there are only two, if I remember right. And so uh, the population will become very, very vulnerable and if, uh, if Bombay is attacked or bombed. Um, so... There is an exodus on the, on the West Coast. There's also an exodus in places like Cochin. Um, now, why that happens is it happens pretty much everywhere. It's much more on the, uh, on the eastern seaboard. Uh, but there is, there is a, a, a fortnightly report from Sindh, which says that there's panic in Sindh. So, you know, Sindh. And so uh, this is one of the things that the book tries to establish, that, uh, hey, this is not about Madras alone. This is, uh, you know... Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, a pan-Indian kind of uh, phenomenon. Um, there, there were reports of submarines um, 
uh, of the Bombay coast. Um, a couple of merchant ships are taken down uh, by a Japanese sub uh, in Bombay, uh, off Bombay, or, well, I mean, some distance off Bombay. And there are reports of submarines around Cochin. So there is some activity, naval activity then, but that's not surprising during the war. Okay, we're closing up. Okay. Uh, I like to draw a parallel between the panic or the big flap in um, 42 and the panic in 1962 when the Chinese attacked. Okay. Uh, when the Chinese attacked, they came to Tawang, Sela, and stopped at Bombila. And Pandit Nehru or the Indian government thought that now the next stop is Tezpur and the plains of Assam. So he ordered the treasuries of, in Assam to burn up all their papers and money and things like that. Was there any such similar thing that took place when you're evacuating Madras or Vishakhapatnam or somewhere like that? Yeah, so uh, there was this huge debate on, uh, on scorched earth uh, in India at the time. Uh, because in Burma, uh, there was some scorching of the earth. That is, don't leave anything to the Japanese. Um, Calcutta has a kind of, if you, a kind of possible scorched earth policy that if this happens, this is what we might do. Because there's some, some factories there that actually make things that material that could be used for the war effort. So there's a great deal of criticism. The nationalist leaders are against the scotch earth policy. You know, Gandhi, for instance, is completely against it. That, you know, how can you, how can you just back off and, 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 and burn things and, and destroy things? Uh, so nothing really happens, actually, on the scotch earth front. But uh, it, is, it is under consideration. Um, so there's this one funny story among uh, the other funny stories. So there's this. ICS uh, officer Jai Rajan, uh, who's, uh, who's one of the few officials in the Madras government who stays back, who's asked to stay back. So he's at the Madras club, which is you know uh, this sort of posh, very posh club in Madras. And the Raja of Chetinad has, has donated his whole se cellar of wines to be drunk. So every evening he's drinking uh, the wine before the Japanese come, because they, you know, the government is gone. They're just waiting for the Japanese to attack on the basis of this false information <laughs> that Hope receives. And he actually says, after a while, we just take out all the bottles of wine and pour it down the drain and not allow the Japanese to enjoy them. So this is a kind of scorched earth policy, if you like, but with a slightly different twist. So that happens. Yeah. I just mentioned that because it was quite funny. But no, no serious scorching worth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of BIC, I would like to thank Mukund and Sriram for such an engaging session, and to all of you for being here. Thank you. Have a good night.